Hi, it's Louis Malmadrona welcoming you to the third session of the Medical Aspects of Ceremony. Tonight we'll be talking about the medical aspects of the Hambalachia. And we've already touched a little bit on the Hambalachia during the first session, but we'll, we'll review it a bit and proceed to consider some of the medical aspects. The painting that you see here is called Man Gets So Excited He Forgets His Weapons. It's an Inuit painting from um, Northern Ontario. Probably if you're hunting bears, you shouldn't get so excited that you forget your weapons. And that's part of our course is to get you so prepared that you won't forget anything. So, um, I wanted to, we talked about Charles Eastman previously, but I just wanted to acknowledge him again because Charles Eastman, or Ohiesa, a Dakota uh, from Minnesota, <coughs> is, is the person who brought these ideas into the Boy Scouts of America. And he is responsible for the Order of the Arrows, for the modified vision quests that, that scouts undertake um, for all of the Native American elements that have entered into Boy Scouts. And <coughs> he's a marvelous person to read and to read about. His books are available as mostly free downloads. And he was the physician, as I mentioned in the first session, present at the Wounded Knee Massacre. This is, of course, Adam Beach portraying him in the movie, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. So much of what Americans and Canadians know about Hambalagia comes from Charles Eastman via the Boy Scouts. So <coughs> the idea of the Hambalagia is to, the word itself means to cry for a vision or to lament for a vision. And um, so there's an implicit cosmology here in that people are entitled or can ask the mysterious world, the great mystery, for help in the form of a vision. And, and these vision quests or hamblechias usually take place in relatively isolated places and the seeker is generally without food or water during the quest. The seeker classically remained isolated in, in the area of the quest as long as it took to achieve the goal up to four days and once upon a time, as I've read, if your vision came in three hours, you were done, and you packed it up and came back. And if it took four days, it took four days. <laughs> Nowadays, um, people tend to, tend to commit to a period of time, and whatever happens, the commitment to that time period remains, which is usually one day, two days, three days, or four days. I've not heard of vision quests or hambalachias lasting more than four days. So, um, again, there's many ways to do the hambalachia. Hambalachia itself is a Lakota word. And so we'll be talking mostly about the Lakota style of crying for a vision. But almost every tribe in North America had some variant of this. Um, sometimes it was called a fasting ceremony. In When I was in Saskatchewan among the Cree, they would call it going fasting. Uh, I've heard it called that here in Maine among the Wabanaki people. <laughs> and the notion is, um, the notion of fasting is that it, it gets one closer to the spirit world. That if we don't eat or drink, we become more like spirits and therefore more closer to their world and more 
um, eligible to receive communication from an entity from that world. So, <laughs> so a successful vision quest usually involves some aspect of contact with a being from the great mystery or the spirit dimension. So um, sometimes this contact takes the form of a visionary experience or an encounter with an animal. And anyone can cry for a vision, but not everyone will receive it. And um, so how does one undertake a vision quest? Generally, among many people, it's arranged a year in advance, though that, of course, varies. And there are people who are recognized in any given community as being people who can oversee a vision quest or a hambalechia. And um, in Lakota, they've been called Vikasha Wakan or holy men. Um, I'm not, they don't always particularly want to be referred to as such. Um, <coughs> but they're people who are known to take in others and guide them through this process. And in any community, um, people know who that is. And so, so um, no one would go on a Hambalachia without supervision. And I think that's really important to emphasize because um, it's what makes it safe. It's what keeps the safety factor intact. And um, the idea, of course, of going on the Hambalachi is to come to better understand the oneness that we share with all things and to gain some wisdom or, or knowledge or information from the realms of the great mystery that will help us in our lives or the tribe in its life or our family members. So typically, one would bring an offering of tobacco to the elder. This is the, the classic offering. And, and the, if the elder takes it and accepts it, then um, one smokes the chinupa, a chinupa with the elder, and the arrangements are settled. And I've not heard of anyone charging money for Hambalachia, though it's common to gift the elder, sometimes quite generously. And the gift can be in the form of money, but I've never heard of, of a leader asking for money or placing a price on the Hambalachia. And I have heard elders say that they have far too many blankets and they need to pay the rent, but um, they would never say that to the seeker himself or herself, only as an aside to close friends. So, um, so this can be arranged a year in advance, up to a year in advance. And uh, a spot is picked, um, sometimes close in time to the onset, and sometimes it's been picked for months. And in the way that I was trained, um, the Hamblachia typically begins with a, a Nipikaga or revitalization ceremony, which we talked about in week two for purification and revitalization. Now, in the way I was taught, the seeker comes to the first two rounds of the Nipikaga. This in between the second and the third round is when medicine and water is consumed. And the seeker then consumes what medicine and water he or she requires and then is taken by the helpers to his spot or her spot. And the Anipikaga then continues to conclusion. Um, in the way that I was taught, when the seeker is brought back from the spot 
they are brought back at the same point in the Inipikaga at which they left and receive medicine and water and then participate in the third and fourth rounds of the Inipikaga. So typically the spot for the quest has been prepared in advance to receive the seeker. And the seeker will have typically prepared uh, prayer ties or chanli pata, which are cloth offerings, cotton cloth, in enclosing tobacco tied on a string. And, and these, these chanli pata will be looped around the spot where the seeker will be. The, the most common number of, of chanli pata that I've heard people make is 405. And the most common color that I've encountered is red, though variations abound. And it's important to emphasize that however they do things, wherever you are, is the way they do them there, and that's how they're done there. And we don't um, criticize people for how they do things where they do them. If they do them in a good way, in the way that they were taught, in a respectful way, uh, that honors the ancestors. So um, the sacred place is sometimes on top of a hill or on a bluff, and sometimes um, in the forests, sometimes on a rock in a meadow. Um, it's whatever is whatever comes to the leader and the seeker uh, as the right place to be. So, um, so. The seeker is placed inside the, this um, enclosure of tobacco ties and, and prepares to receive a vision. Now, there are many variations on, on what the seeker wears, and none are wrong, none are right, except for the people who hold those understandings. I've, I've encountered people who only wear a buffalo robe, and you might think that's not very warm, but buffalo robes are amazingly warm. Um, I've encountered people who have just taken one thin blanket, which hasn't turned out that well in general, um, but I've encountered people who have insisted on doing that, or have been counseled to do that. Um, I've encountered um, people taking a bedroll inside of a tarp, or sometimes um, people have a tarp, tarp shelter to retreat into. Um, the variations are endless. Some people stand for as long as they can. Some people sit. Some people feel free to sleep for the dreams that come in sleep are sometimes the most powerful visions that we can encounter. Some people try n never to sleep. So uh, many variations exist. Far be it for me to say what's right. Um, so at the end of the vision quest at the Hambalachia, the helpers come and take the seeker back to the Anipikaga. And the seeker reveals what he wishes or she wishes, and the elder take, receives it, sometimes comments on it, sometimes doesn't, sometimes comments four days later. Uh, sometimes we have to understand that it will take years for full realization of, of what it all mean, meant. So um, what are the medical aspects of doing Hambalachia? Well, um, thirst, potentially dehydration depending on the climate. Now, um, vision quests or hamblechias take place in these days in all kinds of climates. When I lived in Arizona, we did hamblechia in caves in the desert. And and that was quite a different climate than, say, South Dakota, where it's particularly humid, or Maine, which is humid, 
or say eastern Washington, which is terribly dry and potentially hot in the daytime and freezing at night. So I suspect that wise elders modify protocol in accordance with local conditions. And, and I must say that I've not encountered any casualties or adverse events related to Hamblechia when done under the supervision of elders within cultural teachings ever. And, and one of the things that, that um, I've repeatedly told my colleagues is that elders are really smart. They're not going to put people into risky situations in which those people might die because it looks badly on them. It's not uh, a good thing if you put someone out for a hamblechia and they die. So, um, so one takes precautions. We can learn much from examining the precautions that elders take with particular kinds of clients. Now, why do we need to, to consider medical aspects of ceremony at all if elders are so smart and can handle everything? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is that we've introduced drugs into the world. And there are people who um, plan on participating in ceremony while they're taking medications. And they may or may not tell the elder what they're taking or that they're taking anything. They may or may not tell us that they're going into ceremony. And some of these interactions of drugs and dehydration can be potentially serious. And so we've, we've created a mixing of worlds that's quite different from the world before Columbus, the world of Hambalachia before invasion and conquest. And as part of, of that creation of the post-conquest world, we've, we've created something that we call ego, which is when people insist that they can do things that perhaps they cannot do. So, um, for example, going on a four-day hamblechia while taking medications and not telling anyone about it, about the medications on the one side and the hamblechia on the other side. So the solution, of course, is good collaboration among elders, seekers, and physicians. And in order to have that good communication, we all need to understand each other's worlds and, and how we think and how we act and what we do. So that's the purpose of this course, is to create that kind of understanding. So, um, so thirst is what motivates animals to drink in order to maintain fluid balance. And, and traditionally, or conventionally, or in the past, thirst has been viewed as a homeostatic response to changes in blood volume or tonicity. Just a nice shot of one of our um, altars that's being um, assembled for Hamblechia. So um, what's interesting, though, is that drinking behavior is regulated too rapidly to be controlled by blood composition directly. And instead, it, it appears that our brain anticipates imbalances in fluids and electrolytes before they happen. There's thirst-promoting neurons in the subfornical organ in the brain, which respond to inputs from the oral cavity during eating and drinking, and then integrates that information with information about the composition of the blood. So that integration allows these neurons to predict how ongoing food and water consumption will alter fluid balance in the future, and then to adjust our behavior preemptively so that we actually prevent what could happen from happening. 
So, um, so these, these types of findings provide an understanding of long-standing behavioral observation, including the prevalence of, of people drinking fluids during meals, uh, the rapid quenching of thirst, and the fact that oral cooling is thirst quenching. So thirst is one of, of the aspects of hamblechia that people have to deal with. And um, no studies exist on the thirst and, and dehydration that result from participation in the hamblechia. So um, certainly seekers drink water um, before going out on the hill, as it's sometimes referred to, and upon returning from the hill. Um, and we've talked about ways that that, that can be done, though there are, are many ways. <clears throat> A literature does exist on dehydration and endurance sports events, and it's hard to say how relevant that literature is to Hambalechia, for um, people don't tend to do anything during Hambalechia but sit or stand or lie. Um, so, um, but we can, we can look at that literature and, and it can help us to establish some guidelines perhaps or, or some basic ideas that we can explore. So we know that, that healthy athletes can tolerate considerable dehydration without any serious health consequences. And I, I know some serious athletes that can lose um, uh, up to 10% of their body weight before competing in, in um, wrestling or um, martial arts events in order to make weight. I'm not sure that's such a healthy thing to do, but, but I'm aware of people who do it. So, um, and, and studies have shown that dehydration leading to up to 4% loss in body weight doesn't even interfere with peak performance in, in athletic events. So, so if someone was significantly dehydrated, meaning they have too low a volume in their bloodstream, we would see a rapid heart rate, tachycardia. We would see lightheadedness when standing, um, orthostatic hypotension, and we would see poor skin turgor. And we almost never see those during hambalechia. So um, the risk in high endurance exercise or high endurance sports events is exercise associated hyponatremia which is common, up to 51% of people experience this in prolonged endurance events. But the good news is it doesn't cause any symptoms and it corrects quickly. And however, uh, in some conditions among some people and in some sporting events, exercise associated hyponatremia has been so severe that it's led to seizures and even deaths. Though, as I said before, there have been no deaths reported during elder supervised hamblechia. So what do supervising elders do to avoid such complications? Well, we should, we should think about that. So in my experience, um, if an elder, elders pray and receive guidance from the spirit world. And this is a strange idea probably for many physicians. Um, it's not something that physicians necessarily practice. But in my experience, elders often, often obtain really good information. And people who are questionable might be asked to do just a one or a two day hamblechia because of their health and to see how they do. And now, I want to add a few things about what happens while the person is sitting in their spot. Uh, elders frequently check on them, though rarely are they seen. 
but but elders frequently uh, sneak out to the area and take a look to see how things are going and what the person is doing and and just to check it out. Sometimes um, they send their helpers. Often they go themselves. But people are actually under under quite a bit of surveillance. They're not alone in the woods, left to their to the devices of nature. And um, and sometimes um, elders will actually bring medicine to people on their vision quest. Now, medicine is not the same as water. This is an important distinction in the Lakota world. So medicine could be a cup of sage tea, or it could be um, sweetgrass tea, or it could be um, a lemon drop. And elders provide whatever medicine is necessary to support the process that's unfolding. And they know when to do this because of the guidance that they get from the spirit world. And they know when not to do this. Now, what if it rains? Well, some elders teach that in your vision quest, you're entitled to anything that comes out of the sky. I've, I've encountered some who disagree with this, of course, for no one agrees with everything. But um, this is one way that the potential dehydration is mitigated. Um, so, and I've also seen elders bring people in before the, the time that they were supposed to come in because they weren't doing well, because, because they were not um, on a trajectory to go that length of time or distance and, and needed to be brought in. And again, this is spirit guided um, on their part. So, so what is, what is dehydration? So another body of literature suggests that 2% dehydration is the threshold for impaired impairment, any degree of impairment, even subtle, measurable impairment, even if no one notices, um, in exercise performance. And, um, but we don't know, we have no idea what the threshold is um, for impairment in strength and power that's observed with dehydration. So, um, so the potential for dehydration to impair cognition appears very small and related primarily to distraction or discomfort and not to the dehydration itself. And this would be consistent with what we see in Hamblegia. Um, here's another paper that we'll draw from in talking about dehydration. So, so here's a factor, age. Age matters. And people are becoming older and older. And older people are participating in amblechia. And so um, the older one gets, the more difficult it is to tolerate dehydration. Now, where are the lines? What are the limits? No one knows, especially among the healthy elderly. Um, among the unhealthy elderly, mortality rates with dehydration have been reported as high as 40 to 70 percent. So um, how healthy you are matters. Diabetes matters. People with diabetes are particularly at risk for dehydration. And um, we have to keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit later about how do we modify medications taken for diabetes as, during the humbleia. But but we have to understand that people with diabetes are more at risk for dehydration and perhaps 
should should do shorter hambalechias as they begin in order to see how their body responds to the challenge. So reasons for early termination of a hambalechia could be confusion, um, fever, vomiting, diarrhea, persistent lightheadedness or dizziness even at rest, bladder infection, other kinds of infections, because all of these things make you more at risk for dehydration, for the effects of dehydration. So um, we are bags of water, as was said in a Star Trek episode that I love, um, where the silicon life forms greeted the bags of water. So uh, water accounts for about 60 to 75% of our body weight in adults, 63% for males and 52% for females, and normally fluctuates by only about 0.22% of body weight. Two-thirds of the body fluid is in the intracellular fluid, and the remaining one-third is in the extracellular fluid. So of the extracellular fluid, 80% is between the cells, or interstitial, and 20% is in the bloodstream, or plasma. The major cation, or um, positively charged element in the extracellular fluid, is sodium, whereas the major cation, or positively charged particle in the intracellular fluid, is potassium. So dehydration is a decrease in total body water, resulting from either excess loss of water, usually of a pathological origin, or failure to increase water intake to adequately compensate for losses, which is what we're doing on purpose in Hambalechia, or inability to ingest water in sufficient amounts. <clears throat> There's hypertonic dehydration, which means losing more water than sodium. And so the sodium level is above normal. And the osmolality of the serum, that me meaning um, how, much is, how much solute is in solution, is greater than 290 milliosmoles per liter. There's also hypotonic dehydration. So losing more sodium than water, in which case the sodium level is low, less than 135 milliequivalents per liter, and the serum osmolality is low, less than 280 milliosmoles per liter. So um, when there's also isotonic dehydration, which is um, equal losses of sodium and water. So when we lose this extracellular fluid, um, our blood pressure goes down because we just don't have the fluid to maintain it. And when that happens, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system is stimulated. And, and when we stimulate this system, we start to reabsorb more sodium and water in the kidneys. It starts with pro-renin, which is located in the juxtaglomerular cells of the afferent, meaning coming into them, arterioles, meaning little arteries, of the kidneys. So a fall in the mean arterial pressure stimulates the release of renin from pro-renin, and this renin enters the bloodstream and travels all around the body. So renin then, through an enzyme, acts on angiotensinogen to release angiotensin 1, most of which is converted to angiotensin 2 by an angiotensin converting enzyme locating in the, the cells that line the blood vessels in the lungs the so-called endothelial cells of the pulmonary circulation. 
So we know that angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. It makes, it makes your arteries tight. It also has a direct and powerful effect on causing the kidneys to hold on to sodium and water, which then increases the extracellular fluid volume. It also causes the release of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex, the adrenal gland. The adrenal cortex is the center of the adrenal gland. And aldosterone results in our further reabsorbing sodium in the distal tu in the tubules of the kidney, increasing the sodium content even further, and ultimately increasing the extracellular fluid volume. So um, the last thing that angiotensin II does is to stimulate the release of antidiuretic hormone vasopressin from cells in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus inside the brain. So um, this arginine vasopressin is synthesized in these neurons in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. It's transported from these neurons to the posterior pituitary, where it's released into the bloodstream. And um, what it does is increases the permeability of the collecting ducts of the kidney, causing us to hold on to more water than solute. And so your whole, you, you're hit, this is where you run the risk of becoming hyponatremic because you're holding on to more water than salt. And so what, what stimulates the release of arginine vasopressin? Well, too much sodium in the blood, hypernatremia, hypovolemia, too little volume of blood. Plain old exercise does it, stress does it. And lots of medications, including narcotics and anesthetics. And here's an interesting aside, um, because I've run into people who think that they can go on hambalechia and keep taking their narcotics. Well, is that a good idea? I mean, clearly, in the face of narcotics, one can have a much more profound effect of dehydration than in the absence of narcotics. Because of the release of arginine vasopressin, the risk of, of um, hyponatremia is greater in the presence of narcotics than in their absence. And interestingly, the people that I ran into were not planning to tell the elder about this either, because the elder didn't approve of narcotics for anything under any circumstance whatsoever. So there's also some cholinergic, a cholinergic stimulation can also lead to the secretion of vasopressin. Um, so um, vasopressin release is, is decreased by hyponatremia. So there's a feedback loop, obviously, by drinking alcohol, by diuretics, and by caffeine. There's at least three known types of vasopressin receptors. There's V1A, V1B, and V2. We're so creative at naming these receptors, aren't we? Um, the V1A receptor is located on vascular smooth muscle cells, and when stimulated through G protein coupling, increases intracellular calcium concentration, which results in vasoconstriction, which increases blood pressure. V2 receptors are found in the tubular cells in the thick ascending loop of Henle in the kidney and in the collecting ducts, and it, they, they mediate the antidiuretic effect of arginine vasopressin. So these diuretic effects are the result of the activation of adenylate cyclase which leads to an increase in cyclic AMP, resulting in augmentation of the permeability of the luminal side of the cells to water, urea, and other solutes. And of course, um, 
two clinical situations in which alterations in vasal pressin secretion occur are the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of ADH, SIADH it's often called, and diabetes insipidus in which there's just not enough vasopressin. So, <clears throat> so that's the physiology. So what are some of the age-related changes that we need to be aware of? Well, as, as we age, we have less total body water due to a decrease in lean body mass and an increase in the percentage of body fat. Now, that's statistically true, but of course, on an individual basis, we fight that as hard as we can, um, some of us at least. And the percentage of body mass as water declines from 60% of body weight in young men to as little as 45% in elderly women is quite substantial. So also structural as well as functional changes happen in the kidney with aging. We lose nephrons. Uh, those that are left perform less effectively. And the rate at which the glomeruli filter blood decreases. By age 80, this glomerular filtration rate has diminished about 10% per decade from young adulthood to about 30 milliliters per minute, 300 milliliters per minute. And the creatinine clearance um, has declined about 30%. <clears throat> There's also lessened responsiveness to hormonal signals, which cause the kidneys to function less efficiently in concentrating urine and correcting water loss. There's reduced renal or kidney secretion of renin, which stimulates the release of aldosterone. And this reduced secretion of renin leads to a decrease in serum aldosterone, which then affects sodium reabsorption in the renal tubules. So there's evidence that in the, this impaired renal response to vasopressin causes the kidneys to be less able to concentrate urine and that the rate of water excretion and pattern of constituent electrolytes change with age. So older people have more trouble holding on to their water and their salt. Older adults have also been found to have increased plasma vasopressin and vasopressin receptor sensitivities, indicating that the problem is in the kidneys and not elsewhere. So, um, so there's some consider these are some considerations for people as they age and wish to do hemiplegia. But what about, is there a risk of acute kidney injury, which is of course um, dreaded and, and um, a bad thing? Can the level of dehydration encountered in the humblechia lead to acute kidney injury? To my knowledge, no cases have been reported, but have there been cases that have not been reported because they either recovered or, or no one noticed? Because those who could notice did not know about the ceremony, and those that knew about the ceremony did not know about the change in renal function. This is something that we don't know. But but acute kidney injury is something that, that's an increasing global concern. So um, how does it happen? Well, um, when, when less blood reaches the kidneys, which is called hyperperfusion, then less blood is being filtered by the glomeruli, which is, which is called a decreased glomerular filtration rate. And of course, this is an adaptive response to, to volume depletion, which was what we're talking about in the hemiplegia, and systemic low blood pressure. Now, we're, we're not likely to encounter a renal vascular, acute renal vascular stenosis or thrombosis or uh, cardiac failure, heart failure, um, or the hepatorenal syndrome, but the things of concern to us are volume depletion and low blood pressure. So um, what we're 
concerned about here is acute tubular necrosis in the kidney, which results from a variable mix of, of changes and often occurs after one or more insults, including not getting enough blood, uh, dehydration, uh, drugs, um, poisons, um, and things like that. So um, acute tubular necrosis seems highly unlikely in healthy people participating in hambalechia, but could be more theoretically possible among people with diabetes, heart disease, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, or cancer. And we best identify the volume depletion um, in these people through the um, postural hypertension, dizziness, and a large pulse rate change greater than 30 beats per minute on standing. So, so this, this is a bit of the physiology that we're concerned about. But what about the medications that many people take? What would you do with insulin doses? You can't just keep giving someone the same insulin dose if they're not eating, if they're fasting. Um, I think it's perfectly reasonable to check blood sugars um, regularly during the day, during the hambalachia, to go with a, a glucose meter and to check sugars and to respond accordingly and not in accordance with the treatment regimen that was established outside of the hambalachia. And, and that would certainly be my recommendation is, is to um, switch to a short-acting insulin, um, perhaps in combination with with a basal dose of Lantus insulin that one knows is, is safe and during fasting. And um, certainly I would stop metformin because of the potential damage to the kidney. And I would definitely not use um, glipizide, gliburide, or medications like that. Um, this is why I think with someone on insulin that it's reasonable to do to start off with a one-day hamblechia or a two-day hamblechia with close monitoring. Now, um, this is a this is typically what I've seen elders do, um, though I don't know if if all elders would do that. Certainly, I would stop diuretics during hamblechia, and. Um, for the most part, one would cut back on hypertensive medications. Again, it could be useful for people to um, monitor their blood pressure while on hambalachia if they've been on significant medications for hypertension. And, and one can establish a formula with them for what to take um, given particular levels of blood pressure. Um, Beta blockers are, are really useful for people who have had heart attacks. They're good for blood pressure control. But beta blockers prevent you from increasing your heart rate. And they can be particularly difficult in hambalachia on a hot day when, when one might want the heart rate to increase. So, so these are some considerations about medication. And um, what about... Um, Psychotropic medication. What about antidepressants? Well, it's simple if people are taking fluoxetine because it has such a long half-life, it'll still be around when they're done. But many of the other drugs have a much shorter half-life. And, and to stop them places the person at risk for the withdrawal syndrome. Um, but to continue them at full dose, runs a risk of that syndrome of anti-diuretic hormone that we talked about. So my proposal is typically to lower them to the lowest feasible dose that doesn't um, cause withdrawal. I'm, I'm not happy about people on chronic opiate therapy doing hamblechia. It'd be interesting to find out what other people think about that. Um, Stimulants can be stopped because children regularly take 
drug holidays during school vacations and and on weekends and and nothing bad happens um abruptly stopping benzodiazepines can lead to seizures that's a problem um one solution is to switch to long-acting benzodiazepines another solution that i've seen some elders um, follow is to tell the person to get off the benzos before they come to their vision quest and that usually typically has to be done over a, a matter of months um, <clears throat> Antipsychotic drugs, anti-epileptic drugs, and lithium can also be problematic during states of relative dehydration, with lithium being the most problematic. Um, antipsychotics are especially problematic on hot days in terms of heat regulation. And so um, one needs to, to adjust the dose on that basis lower the dose typically on a very hot day, and also to have strategies for other strategies for the person to cool off if necessary. Um, so even, even drugs like all drugs can have negative impacts after a four-day fast. And I just wanted to call attention to antibiotics and, and even antifungal agents that can cause cognitive uh, confusion, memory loss, exhaustion, and even delirium after a four-day fast. Now, these <clears throat> effects typically dissipate quickly once fluid and electrolyte balances and nutrition have been restored. But I've also seen people uh, diagnosed as being psychotic or having other psychiatric diagnoses mistakenly after ceremony um, when their um, mental status changes are due to the combination of fasting and antibiotics or other similar kinds of medications. So, um, and, and why don't people tell their doctors about their ceremonies? Because they don't want to get yelled at, because they don't want the kind of, of um, criticism that many non-Native doctors levy upon Native people who continue to participate in ceremony. So, um, and the list of antibiotics that can cause um, delirium is huge. Now, logically, the solution might be to delay the vision quest until the antibiotics are done, but Sometimes people have to schedule their time off and they don't want to do that. And so they don't tell anyone about the antibiotics that they're still taking because um, this is the only time they've got in the year to do the vision quest. It can be problematic. Antifungals do the same thing. The, the azo fungicides and, and griseofulvin, which people might be taking just for bad toenails. And they might not want to stop taking their medicine for their toenails just because they're going on vision quest. So, so you can see it's, it's more complicated today than it was in 1491. The interaction of pharmaceuticals and um, uh, potentially negative lifestyle choices, um, disease, contemporary uh, diseases, and um, traditional ceremonies is is more complicated than it used to be, and and the bottom line is, I think that we need uh, trusting collaborative relationships among elders, physicians, and and seekers of visions, in which we can openly discuss the medications, the the diagnoses, the illnesses that people have, and come up with with workable plans that allow people to still participate in ceremony, albeit perhaps um, in a graded manner sometimes until we see how their body reacts, and um, continues to respect the wisdom of, of elders as it comes from spirit sources. 
So, um, so this is what I have to say tonight about the Hambalachia ceremony. Um, always uh, a beautiful ceremony. And um, one that, that we want to celebrate and promote to the extent that we can. Um, and um, that's all. Thank you for listening.